Hello. 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 Hello.
page of them. And so there's a, there's a whole slew of new accounting standards that are coming up. Most of these are going to have little to no effect on the village's financial statements. The one, the one on this list that I think is probably most that could potentially have uh, a more significant effect would be the very last one on leases. Um, lease standards are changing not only for governments but also for, for any organizations. And it used to be if you had a very short term lease, you didn't have to report anything on the balance sheet. It was just kind of a pay it out of operating expenses. <coughs> Uh, that the accounting for those leases is going to be changing, and except for very limited circumstances, um, all leases are going to be reflected on the balance sheet uh, as of the May 31, 2021 year. Uh, so, if the village does have any leases outstanding, the accounting for that's going to change. Uh, again, I think the rest of those changes that are on there are, 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 are pretty small in terms of their overall impact. Uh, uh, so that's it for the for the two letters and then the financial statements themselves. Um, obviously, it's quite a few pages, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I do want to hit a couple of the highlights. Um, I want to point out the first couple of pages after the index is the auditor's opinion. We've issued an unmodified opinion on your financial statements, uh, which is the best type of opinion that you have. It means that we believe the financial statements are fairly stated. In accordance with accounting principles for governments, uh, and that they don't require any, any modifications. Um, the management's discussion and analysis begins on page three and goes through a few pages. If you haven't read through that section, I'd encourage you to do so. You know, a, a lot of people uh, aren't necessarily adept at reading and understanding financial statements right away, so this management's discussion and analysis. Um, in a more readable format, without a lot of the heavy financial statement numbers, charts, graphs, uh, that, that management's discussion and analysis does provide a more readable format and give you a little bit of a sense of where things are uh, within the village. So, um, in an overall standpoint, if you look at and most of the information in that management's discussion and analysis, uh, is on a government-wide basis, so you don't have a lot of the fund detail in that management's discussion and analysis. But it shows that the village's total net position increased during the 16-17 year by almost a million dollars, 950000 roughly. Mostly because a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the money that's coming in for um, uh, renovations to the wastewater treatment plant, to the water treatment plant, a lot of that money that's coming in isn't being offset by expenses on a government-wide basis, it's being offset by capital construction on a government-wide basis. So there's, there's a bit of a, a, a mismatch, if you will, between the money that's coming in, some of which is revenue, the money that's going out, all of which is capitalized. Uh, so as a result of that, you've got an increase in, in the net position this year. Uh, the financial statements themselves, they begin on page four, and the first couple of pages, four and five, are those government-wide statements. So again, you don't have any of that fund-level detail. The fund-level detail that you're more used to seeing on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis begins on page six, uh, with balance sheets by fund. And then on page eight, the statements of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance uh, by fund. Uh, just a couple things that I wanted to point to in the notes to the financial statements. Um, Debbie had pointed out an error to me this evening, and so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, on page 25, in the short term deck, in note six, we refer to both of the bond anticipation notes as relating to the wastewater treatment plant, and that's incorrect. Only one of them is the wastewater treatment plant. And the other one, the three million dollar one, uh, relates to the water projects. And so, just a uh, slight error there in the way that that was written. And then the other thing that I wanted to point to in the notes: last year we had talked a little bit. Uh, last year, I believe, was the first year that the village adopted new pension standards. Um, if you recall, the pension 
standards as to how the pensions are accounted for the state ERS and PFRS systems who changed uh, last year. And it used to be that the village would just report an expenditure for whatever the state told you to pay, and there was no overall liability. Even though at the statewide level, uh, the state pension systems aren't fully funded. So at the statewide level, there is an overall, uh, an overall pension liability. Last year, the accounting for those pensions changed, and the village had to report uh, what's called a proportionate share of that liability. And so there was a, um, a small sliver of the whole statewide liability is allocated out to all the municipalities across New York State, including the village. Okay. Uh, beginning on page 28 of the notes to the financial statements is several pages about that note, and I just wanted to point that out because, again, it was new last year. It's still, uh, it, it's still fairly new. Uh, I want to point to a couple of things on here. At the bottom of page 29, there's a small table, and it refers to, um, on this, as a for instance, the ERS system on a statewide basis uh, has a net pension liability of about $9.3 billion, of which they've allocated $209,000 and change to the village, based on your share of the total. And with the PFRS system, the statewide liability is a little bit over $2 billion. Your share of that is about $50,000, a little bit less than that. <coughs> um, the other place that I wanted to point to also in that note, uh, just so you could see it, um, a, a lot of how these numbers are derived is actuarial calculations. And so those actuarial calculations come with a lot of um, flexibility, if you will. Those numbers can change dramatically depending on the assumptions that are that are built into the calculation. And so on page 33, there is a table that shows a little bit about how those calculations can be affected. Um, currently, the ERS and PFRS systems are calculating their, um, their required contributions and they're calculating their net pension liability on the assumption that their investments are going to earn 7% a year. Okay. Um, that table in the middle of the page shows you what would happen if they changed those assumptions. <coughs> so if they changed those assumptions from 7% to 6%, the village's liabilities would go from about $260,000 to about $820,000. Because as the investments earn less, you'd have to pay more. Uh, on the other hand, if they change that assumption to say 8%, uh, your share of the pension would go from a, from a liability of about $260,000 to an asset of about $205,000. So you can see there's a lot of change just based on that one assumption. Uh, and then the last piece that I wanted to point to, or the last thing I wanted to point to in that note, the next page on page 34, uh, is a table at the bottom of the page, and this just shows the effect, the overall effect on the government-wide net position from year to year based on um, based on these changes as a result of the new standard. Um, in an overall sense, uh, on a government-wide basis, about fifty thousand dollars in additional expenses was reported as a result of the new standard. Right. Uh, about 39,000 to the ER system, about 10,000 uh, to the PMR system. Um, page 37 through 39 are budget comparison schedules for the general uh, water and sewer funds. Um, and then the last couple of pages, page 44 and 45, uh, because we do the audit under government auditing standards, we have to issue an additional report on your internal control and compliance over laws and regulations. Uh, we found no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies in the control system, and we found no non-compliance uh, with laws and regulations during the time of the audit. So, um, so overall, field work itself went really smoothly. Uh, my thanks, as always, uh, to Vicki, to Tammy, for everybody in the office for helping us get through the audit quickly and smoothly, and. 
With that, I'll open it up to any questions. <coughs> So it's something is it new. better to do it? Yes, it is absolutely new. Okay. So I'll do it then. I would prefer to have you do it then. Thank you. So any other comments from the public? Yes. Jane Dennis, Dennis, 13, 13 South Street. Um, I was wondering about the issue of the sidewalks uh, that there's uh, on the agenda. Uh, whether a bond will be uh, issued for uh, somewhere in the vicinity of a quarter of a million dollars to continue uh, with the sidewalk project. And does this include the South Street to Tamarack uh, part of the uh, sidewalks and something else? Because originally, um, it was said that there was uh, only a deficit of $130,000 to complete uh, that portion of the sidewalk. Uh, so, is there a reason why, uh, you know, it's almost doubled as far as... Well, there are two, two additional bond? costs that weren't there when that was estimated. The first is, there wasn't the construction observation costs. That was, the, that was the actual construction of the sidewalk. So we, we hire, in this case, Fisher Engineering, which did the other part of the sidewalks to do, do all the inspections, certify all of them, that they meet every standard, because if for some reason something is substandard, um, DOT may not actually pay it. So that's where they're, they're kind of the village's eyes on the ground. Any day that construction's going on, there's a person from Fisher Engineering. Um, and so that part wasn't that. That was about sixty-six thousand dollars. And then there's bond costs itself on the bond attorney, the, the bonding company. Uh, and so that's the that's the, the two additional costs that went in there to to bring it up. To it up. Well, does that uh, count uh, the town portion of the, uh, the sidewalk extension? Because it seems like sixty-six thousand dollars for somebody to observe. The construction process is a is a lot. I mean, that's thirty thousand no, dollars. It only has to do with from Squaw's Lane to Tamarack. The, the, the town part of it is other than just minor repairs of the landscaping right. part of it's done. Lake Street, South Street, up to Squaw's Lane is done. So it's that last part, and we can't add anything new to the project. 
and you could only do things that were in the original project, and that's the only thing left that wasn't completed in the original project. So the um, 66000 for the observation for the extension to Tamarack is included in that bond? Correct. And the uh, service of the bond as well? Correct. Okay. It just seems. Uh, oh, it's know. likely. It's likely both those numbers are going to be less the construction cost and the observation. That's assuming ten weeks of construction. The contractor believes it's only going to take seven weeks. So probably those those values are less. But if that's what you you have to. What's like worst case scenario? We know they have to stay for, within that budget because that's what it was originally bid for and allocated for. That's the allocation for. Okay. Any other public comments? <coughs> Elizabeth Meyer, regarding the subject of sidewalks, just um, I'm reminded years ago of the Main Street project and the intention to complete sidewalks to the north end of the village where there's housing, affordable housing, and that seemingly has not happened. Why are we pursuing sidewalks to a blank zone when, in fact, there's some really considerable need of sidewalk at the north end of the village? There, there were a number of high priority areas. South Street was one of the high priority, especially for routes, safe routes to schools, part of it. And that section was also, in, uh, there were five areas that were considered high priority. So we're, we're addressing three of those. Uh, there wouldn't be enough funds in, that, in, in the grant that actually uh, funds to complete it as, as it turns out. Um, so there, we're not done with sidewalks in the village, but we're, the, the, you have to do it in stages, uh, especially if you're going after grant funds. It just seems a little lopsided that we already have housing at that end, people needing sidewalks there, it's already there, and we have an established residential zone that has, has existed without sidewalks. And we had asked for that through the Main Street project years ago, so it's just curious. We heard a lot of comments from people going to Tamarack at Larchmont, the, the need for sidewalks on that whole section of South Street. So mm -hmm. not that there, again, there's a lot of needs for sidewalks in the village. And, it, and because of the cost, we've been trying to find some way to help offset the cost. Thank you. And those two grants were, were, were you know, a big part of being able to do that. So other comments or questions in the public comment? OK, if not, I'll move to uh, Item number six is reports from representatives. I see Nancy Miller. I think he's the only rep here. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many times I've announced that it's coming, but the town actually closed and now owns Salo, the uh, habitat on Salo Drive. Mm -hmm. So that um, purchase was made with mm -hmm. town funds that will be fully reimbursed with a uh, grant. And we're excited about that. It just happened. And so we're, there will, at some point, be, I think, a, if not a standing advisory group, I think our desire is to get some input from <coughs> residents who had come to the town board when we're considering that, neighbors sharing concerns about access and signage and wanting to make sure that their private properties and rights didn't get intruded on by opening up the public area. Again, it will be a passive use area. Um, there will be signage. The intent is to ask people to park by the uh, farmer's market and walk up the sale rather than parking right along the drive. But um, So that's actually happened. It's been several years in the process, I think. And um, there, we'll be, I'll be interested in, in the item. We'll go over down on your uh, agenda tonight, the sidewalk maintenance agreement so that the town and the village can continue to collaborate with you doing the clearing of the Route 96 new sidewalk and us uh, to offset your cost related to that. And we do have a meeting tomorrow night and on our meeting, we have um, we request the uh, renewal of the agreement that we have with you when your police officers come and are present when we need them in our town court. Um, we pay you an hourly wait rate, and we're updating that agreement on tomorrow's agenda. The other thing that relates to tomorrow to the village on our um, agenda tomorrow is that it's been um, 
in 2015, the town of Ulysses uh, adopted an ambulance billing policy for the first time. We were the last one of the municipalities in this uh, uh, shared service agreement to do so. And we had not upped or changed our fees. And as you know, um, Brian uh, Snyder periodically does a survey of fees and costs, and he's provided us that information. So we will be looking at current fees, the minimums, the maximums, your current fees, and discussing that tomorrow night to, to consider whether or not it's not a, decision, not a program conclusion that we will, but we will be considering whether or not to increase those fees to help us offset the increase in costs of um, the emergency services that will be valued. I think we are, we also have that table, and we're probably going to also look at possibly changing our cost too. Okay. Yeah, because I, I figured that I wasn't quite sure whether the figures that I had pulled off of the website or something for 2017 were their current rates, but I think we probably change in this part of the budget process, perhaps. So in any case, um, we may or may not uh, do that uh, tomorrow. So those are um, those are things coming up for correction at our meeting. The other um, um, our town zoning um, process continues to keep right along. We have had um, a lot of feedback, some from people here, and we're grateful for the, the feedback. And I'm not quite sure what path it will take to come to closure at the committee level and uh, we need to sort of talk internally about sort of how to manage the transition from the zoning up the committee as it comes to the town board and what kind of process and what kind of focus the town boards in that when it becomes a, a, re a referred document. So that is um, our version of, of zoning. Um, still in the works, but I, I, you know, uh, people have, have made a number of comments and um, we're taking those into consideration. Both the zoning committee and the members of the town board have gotten all those comments as well. So, um, do you have any questions? Town property on the sale is once the snow melts, those trails are not maintained, but they're usable. Right? People can walk on those trails. Right. I think. Um, I, I, I think the Liz is the one with the most updated information, but I know that there's actually a part of why that <coughs> wasn't developed is that there's parts of it that are sort of wetland. And I know that there had been a bit of a footpath or a little footbridge sort of over some of that to get to the trails. But yes, the short answer is yes. I mean, there will be trails that will be open, they will be muddy, and they will be natural. <laughs> Um, and all that that entails. I mean, some of what we, um, I mean, I don't think it's an imminent issue, but one of the things that once I walked, uh, Gordon and I, um, and some of the time board members walked the property early on and noticed that uh, my direction was terrible. <coughs> on the edge of the property that faces toward the um, Fish and Game Club, um, they do have a shooting range that shoots in that direction, but it's down. And so obviously having good signage for anybody that's in that area to make sure that everybody stays safe it will be, I think, one of the things that we might consider yeah. adding in there. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Not for Nancy. I just wanted to, um, I guess, respond a little bit to Elizabeth's question. Um, the reason that this particular grant used as its metric, or whatever the word is, um, the proximity to the school. So we know, we do know that that sidewalk north of town kind of is a, is an issue, but this particular grant program wasn't, wasn't the, uh, the avenue for that. Well, I mean, it, it could have been, but the safe routes to schools part of it would have probably suggested areas that were identified closer that were highly, that were, were hazardous, were, were, would give us more basically points as we did get. Yeah. 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 Ye
But it was, that is one of the five areas that was identified in the county survey on the sidewalks that were of a high priority. But if we would have, we definitely would have not gotten a new grant to cover an additional 400,000 or whatever it might be to do that. So it was a matter of doing what we could with that money at this time and, and we keep, yeah, just keep we, you know, when we, we and I must, I mean, will say that the Michelle Lake and the, at the time was at the town of the uh, you know, she and I primarily put the grant together, but however, realizing that um, we were advised not to go over a million dollars in the request because it would be highly unlikely we get funded about that, or even funded in manufacturing market that. So we try to figure, we try to get, we felt the most critical areas done with the amount of money as you can see, we can always bond and do other ways to pay for it, uh, additional sidewalks. Uh, but yeah, there, and I think it's if people are interested in getting sidewalks, it's good to read the, the Coffins County sidewalk survey that was done that identified these areas. I think it's a good it's a good read to show why certain areas are probably should be done first compared to others. With all due respect, Mr. Mayor, I would argue that Route 96 is a lot more dangerous than South Street. Well, that's, you can argue with the county on that side if you want to argue with them. Um, they, you know, was a, their, their traffic people did that survey. Uh, we didn't do that survey. It wasn't done by us. And uh, so it's, it's, it, is a, it is a critical area, but if there are many critical areas. Uh, you could probably argue Deutsche Street Hill may be the most critical area right in the village for a sidewalk. And there was no way to get away have the funds to finish that last section. And so it's not that there aren't areas that are highly important. I, I won't argue that point with you, but there's only a limited amount of funds to do that. I guess my question is, so you put all those funds uh, Name and address, please. Name and address, please. Terry Canable, 21 Prospect Street. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, like with Dorsey Hill, you could, I know I don't want my children to walk that way to school. They have to go through town because of that hill. It's just too dangerous the way cars whip around it. I guess, I guess my question is, why did you put the money into doing a sidewalk that's halfway up the hill? I mean, I think prioritizing what you're saying seems kind of silly if you're not going to finish the project that makes it actually accessible for people to walk. I mean, I guess, why did you do that before you could have put it someplace else in the village? I guess that's my question. Because, I mean, that if you start that way at the bridge, which is right after the corner from hell, <laughs> They go up the road that children shouldn't be walking on to school. Because that first part was the, is the most expensive part we put in. The shortest and most expensive. So it would have, you know, you would not have done that part. You could have done other things. That would still leave that highly unsafe. And at least there is a semi sidewalk going up that one side of the Torsi Hill. It's a it's a narrow three foot plowed area. Well it's better than it was. I was putting yeah. in that. But it's, that, you know, not doing that and delaying doing that where we right. have funds to do it. That's the I, I that's was the just curious because I'm just wondering because it just seems kind of... There, that's a, there are so many areas in the village that, that need to be done. I still want to walk down the hill without a sidewalk bridge to do this. I think one of, the, one of the issues, too, is specifically with respect to this, this bond is the village, I think I know where this board, what this board will decide, but the village doesn't have to do this section of, of South Street. There's $124,000 roughly left over from the grant, which DOT will only let us use on that section. They won't let us use it anywhere else. So the village could say, eh, it's not really the most important section, we're not going to bond the difference and just do nothing, but then we would lose out on the 124. If they would let us spend the 124 wherever we wanted, that, that would be best, but it's New York State, so we'll kind of have to take it where we can get it. That's my question. I was just wondering why. Right? Yes, Nancy, I know you had your hand up. I forgot one thing. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, and that was just to say that this coming Thursday, the 15th at 7 o'clock, um, uh, Liz, uh, Supervisor Towns is going to be meeting with residents from Falls Road to give an update on the uh, their interest in the in the water district. We've done uh, the map and plan, right. and uh, so they'll be meeting to just sort of a second panel around to get the pulse on uh, residents to see whether um, what they understand of the cost is something they want to pursue. 
Actually, I have a quick question. You need to, Mary? Nancy. 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 You're talking about bringing the water right down Falls Road, currently, where, you know, from Cemetery Road down that way, right? Well, right. the village has done that. Right. Oh, it is already. Yeah. So it is already taken as far as where Grassroots is going to be using this. Because if not, I'm just wondering who's going to pick up the million mile for this water for it to go to the 100 acres Grassroots farm. No, no, the, is that already there? The village, well, I mean, yeah. you do it, but... Yeah, the entire, we, you know, we connected with, we put two new production wells at the state park, took over their tank, took over their production system, came up and went up fall, all the way falls to cemetery. So the line is in there. Okay. However, it's a transmission line. It's not a service line. So now residents who live along falls can ask to tap in. If someone's going to extend the water mains, the village does not pay for that. Okay. So, so grassroots water. So that's brought up about 227. I hadn't gone down there. That's the comment was it's a million dollars a mile to do it. I just want to make sure we're not putting the bill for grassroots to have water. No. Uh, so in the village. No, we, we generally for for development projects that the developer pays for the water extension. Okay, that was my Including question. the school. The school yeah. well, the school's a whole different story. That's not for fun. Yes. If I uh, Jack Katz, 13 South Street, just to get back to the sidewalks a little bit. Um, the engineering fee for observation was 66000 Correct. Well, a rough calculation is that that's over $1,000 a day, which is, engineering is costly, I imagine. Uh, but so they, you know, and including testing, now there's a, every time they pour concrete, they have to they have to take samples. They have to have those samples tested. So it's not just observing. There, it's all the <clears throat> regulatory requirements that DOT requires to have done. Now we could have hired some village employee to do that. But we're not really qualified to do that. So so that's why you know we went out there. They're the firm that designed the sidewalk, but they also do construction. So this encompasses the entire engineering uh, component. The observational part of the engineering component. They already designed, they already engineered they right. already did the design engineering part. Right, of the this design. is like quality control and Correct. making sure Correct. that things get done uh, the way they were. Um, and because you don't want to, you don't want the sidewalk to be no. cracked or fall apart <laughs> in five years because it wasn't you know, the right concrete, the right temperature. Right. Um, surface skated, I mean, all the stuff that you could do with concrete to mess it up. So that's that's what they're doing. They're also making sure it's as thick as it's supposed to be. They mm -hmm. take samples of the concrete. They take samples on the sport uh, and record temperatures. People were questioning, well, how can you pour concrete down near 96 or Lake Street? Well, you can do it if the temperatures are correct. And so they're, they're, that's part of it. It's laundered in the whole part of it. Not that you don't trust the contractor, but that's where all these observations that that DOT requires us to do it, so you know, we have to do that. Yeah, I imagine that it is good to have some quality control in there. Amen. And uh, you can do it in uh, minus 10. It's an exothermic process. Yes. Yes, name and address, please. Adrian Callanan, 26 Greg Street. Does having that kind of engineering observation um, mitigate liability to the village if there is like so if something is done wrong and it it falls apart in an unreasonable period of time having had that kind of quality control that's DOT mandated does that <coughs> does that protect the village in any way? I would say it probably does but I'm not I'm not the village attorney so I, I would hate to say yes or no but that's part of what it's I mean that's what also DOT is trying to protect you from having poor construction, because obviously they have probably paid for a lot of bad construction in the past. Okay. And, and it's, it's, it's highly, yeah, it's very expensive when you pay. It's about $1,000 a day to have this done. We're hoping it doesn't take all 10 weeks so that then the cost is by the time they're there. So if the contractor believes, assuming we don't have monsoons the whole um, uh, March, April, and May, that he can get the project done sooner and then the observational costs will be less. It's actually a good case study in why everything costs so much for governments to do. If you were to pour a sidewalk in on your property, it would cost about one tenth of what this is costing. Uh, Bill, I'm sure, could give us all kinds of horror stories about commercial projects. But as soon as the municipality steps into it because of the requirements, especially when there's grants involved, federal government, state government, all those things, it, it, it is costing about ten times what we would spend to put sidewalk in 
front of you know one of our houses, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so we'll move to item seven. What's the reports from commissioners? Um, so Rachel. Sure. Jason's actually here though. Um, so we could Please talk do. about the. So would you like to make Oh yeah, motion? sure. So what you need is to say all that maybe. No, that's all right. You can do it as a motion now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I move that we um, initiate a permissive referendum for up to $8,100 from the fire apparatus fund. Fire apparatus. Fire apparatus reserve fund for SCBA face masks. Second. Any discussion? And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed abstain. Passes. And we have another <coughs> um, item to look at the <coughs> fire truck lease. Um, so this is for the mini converter and. Yep, so that's what it's for. The mini buffer. Okay, so the first one is the lease agreement. Lease is the. Uh -huh. What part of this shall I read? Just, just that we need to. Um, there's two separate ones. There's the lease agreement, and I don't know if it's because I filled it out, but everything has my name on it to sign. So I, I guess you would request that I be allowed to sign that. Is that, or do you want them to redo it in your name? Typically, I, mean, I sign all kinds mm -hmm. of sign leases and agreements. Right. Uh, unless we have a motion to authorize you to sign them, which we can do that also. Uh, instead of changing yeah. instead of changing those. It is a. It, it, so they don't, yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. <coughs> it's like Marty C. Mayer and him to come in just so we can sign it. Mom. And I think it's only because I filled out the credit application for it. And signed, I signed the credit application. For sure. For sure. Right. Yes. Right. Any recommendations? Okay. So have to change it. Okay. And I mean, we can authorize it tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it is included in. Um, they did put in the addendum and the resolution that um, Guy has suggested it go in. So that was all taken care of too. I don't think it's a big deal. Once it's once it comes back, if you need, are you going to move on this week? Yes. Okay. So now up to you guys. So is the resolution just to offer and learn to sign the contract for the release? The release, yes. The lease agreement. Okay. To be used to purchase the 2018 KME F550 number. Correct. Okay, so this is the 
Is that a motion? Yes, that's my motion. Okay. Second. Um, any discussion? Okay, if not all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstained, it passes. And then the second part of that is the actual contract with Gorn. Okay, is it, so what's the exhibit A and exhibit B for? Those are what Guy Crow wanted in, in the lease agreement. Which are now in the Which are now in the Yes. Okay. And then the second part is the part with form to actually, for them to actually start building the truck. What number is and that within the mm -hmm. truck? Is it two or two or three? Is that it? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to look. Okay. Um, Sorry. So it says the agreement of sale for fire for us. This agreement is made between Gorman Emergency Vehicle. Yes. 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 yes, that's it. So we're just authorizing Gorman you guys to sign the contract? <coughs> yep. Okay, I'd like to authorize I'd like to make sure that we authorize Gorman to sign this contract. I'll second. Okay. Any I'm sorry. That's a majority. All right. Any discussion? Okay, if not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. Passes. They have all their hands. Thank you. <laughs> so you have something on um, prowess drawing and this? Oh, that's good. Okay. Well, no, it, it's, well, it's really it's not, Rachel. Yeah. It's Firehouse. The firehouse drawing, yes. So you've been, we needed to move so that. Is that what you agreed for? Firehouse drawing. I just came. Okay. <laughs> I don't have anything for that. Okay. Right now. Fine. Yes, in the drop box is a fire drawing. <clears throat> right. Oh. Right. Is there anything to. No, I just. I said I'd report back this month or something, and that's where. More of the FYI. Yep. Okay. Okay. He did not get back to me today with an estimated cost, but that's what he's come up with so far. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that means Ben, uh, EMS, and you. But you got kind of lumped into the same oh, thing. Oh, it's twice now? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you can have all of one. Yeah. Um, so the, the only item of business I have is that rate survey. Um, I did not get a chance to look at what the reimbursement rates are, but I know mileage is really the only one that we get a significant portion of. So I would suggest if we want to take any of them, that we go for mileage. We can do that on um, much carry part. Yeah. Right. And, Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? 
Okay, and one, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, for saying. Passes. Okay, thank you. The next thing I have is um, I received posts uh, for what well, they're very uh, variable fluid pumps. Um, we currently have uh, pressure stabilizing pumps in our pump station for Main Street and South Street. I think it's South Street. I don't remember which. Um, and uh, we, they have been in place for a number of years, and we. The last one of them broke. We had the uh, the vendors come in and take a look at it. They recommend that we replace all of them because they're all obsolete and in very bad shape. So we we don't have a backup pump right now. So we had to purchase at least one. Um, and with this quote, we have um, the pumps themselves are are. To replace all three pumps would be $5,200. The, um, the, the installation cost would be $5,500. So I'm moving, um, I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm moving that the, we go ahead with this purchase um, from Fluid Kinetics. Okay, so the amount and then out of what account? Um, this will be out of the water. Um, Water equipment. I believe it's water equipment. You want to do a permissive referendum for it? Yeah, that, I think I don't think okay. I have enough money for it. Yes, I have to. Okay. And how much is it for the It would be for a total of ten thousand seven hundred dollars. Okay. Of the water equipment. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay is there a second to Debbie's motion? Sure. Any discussion or questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Close the screen. It passes. Thank you. All right. And that's, um, that's all I have except for the second session. Okay. Um, the only thing, Deb, and I didn't put it on your list, is um, this is the common sales and service annual maintenance agreement that. Um, Who's comments? They do. Oh, they're the test people. Aren't yes. They? Yeah. Yep. The to design. generate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't. If you want to make a motion to for Marty to sign this. Or if you want to wait for the 21st. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to be here for the 21st. That's right. Can you give it? I, yeah. I'll, I'll delay and bring it up and hold okay. business. Let me read it. Okay. Sounds good. Sorry. It's in the wrong place. Okay. Thank you. Get I, I, I think we figured out why. So I will tell you. I got the kitty in the box so you can't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Gordon, uh, if we can have police and, and healthcare consortium. I'm actually going to table this MOU because I have a couple things I want to clarify on that. Okay. Uh, before we vote on it. Which MOU is that? The Skyline uh, one. Okay. Which is actually Skyline County. Right. Sheriff's Department. Um, so I'm going to table that so I don't have anything for police. Under consortium in the Dropbox, which you may or may not be able to open, is the 2017 fiscal year, which is calendar year, uh, final results for the consortium. We only talk about this every once in a while. But I think it's worth reviewing. Uh, 2017 was the seventh full year of operation for the consortium. And you kind of can get a sense, and I won't go through all the numbers, but get a sense of the scope and scale that the consortium is currently operating under. It's essentially a $42 million health insurance company. Um, we've managed to keep premium increases to 5% or less in each of the last seven years, which if we go back to what we paid in 2010 and extrapolate forward to what other municipalities have paid countywide, it's saved, depending on who does the math, anywhere between 5 and $8 million for, for Tompkins County municipalities. Um, if you've ever wondered where your health bill goes, you don't. <laughs> um, roughly 4,500 insured people, these are all municipal employees, roughly 4,500 insured people results in $25.7 million in medical claims and 11. 
two million dollars in prescription drug costs. Jeez. And so we're glad that that's only increasing at five or six percent a year instead of twelve. Consortium's in really good shape. There's an unencumbered fund balance as of the end of 2017, an unencumbered fund balance of 16.1 million, an additional 9.7 million in reserves required by New York State for various things. So that 16.1 million is what we can use to try to offset rate increases going forward, which is why our premiums only went up <coughs> four percent this year instead of the nine that Excellus is charging to other municipalities. So I just thought it was some numbers are dry, but I thought it was. Interesting enough that if anyone wanted to review it or has questions, just let me know. So I was impressed by the accuracy you know, with the estimates. How, at what point do you reach a scale where you can, right? I mean, we've talked about that a little bit before. So it was, at this point, the estimates are almost like written after it happened, accurate. So, Steve Losey, Losey and Cahill, is one of his researchers, has developed the equivalent of the proprietary model that they want to share, which factors in all kinds of things to arrive at. His estimates are kind of here, they're very good. I will say that his prescription drug estimates were off by 16% two years ago, and there wasn't, we have still haven't figured out why. Uh, the only thing we can think of is a bunch of trial drugs, high end trial drugs, came to market that we didn't, we couldn't have factored in. Um, but we did have several claims in the consortium pool where there were the, you know, twenty-seven thousand dollar per pill version. Um, so that gets absorbed in the prescription side. That's leveled back off in twenty seventeen. So his numbers were were very good. About that. Yeah. But that's you know, we we actually we went back out I think a couple of years ago to RFP to look for other consultants and there just really isn't. Anyone like this guy? He's just, and that is pretty special. His numbers are very, very good. So, Fortunately, we found him in the beginning. How many municipalities are there at the moment? Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine or thirty? Um, that seems low. No, it's twenty-nine municipalities. Most of those are Tompkins, but we have quite a few Portland County municipalities now, a couple from Cuba County. Mm -hmm. um, none of them are Skyler yet, but they're starting to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, there's a potential for 130 some municipalities in just the contiguous counties to Tompkins. I doubt they will all get in. Especially we've got little, we've got tiny municipalities in Cuba County and Portland County with two employees. Mm -hmm. So it might not make sense for them to join. But there's the potential with this that our meetings get really out of hand. Okay. Um, item 8 is correspondence. Uh, we received uh, letters regarding the 46 South Street proposal from Don Mintz, uh, Chris Kale, um, Bennett, I'm trying to think of his name, and um, Ms. Sombre, Mr. Kinner, Ms. Callan, and Mr. Connor. Um, so we acknowledge these. It's not necessarily we're going to discuss those, but we always acknowledge the letters. If you send an individual uh, email or note to a board member, it doesn't necessarily mean it makes any correspondence. If you want it to uh, be part of the public record, uh, then you know, it's best to send it to the full board. So it does get on as part of our correspondence. Um, so unless someone wants to discuss any of those or read mm -hmm. those, I, I would just say that we're acknowledging those. Uh, there were some questions. People were asking me to get copies of these. Uh, as with all requests for information from the village, uh, if you put in a FOIL request, then we'll follow the normal procedure of, uh, of responding to that. Uh, we certainly don't release these before uh, we have, have a meeting, because that's the public record of the other court, yes. Question on that. Uh, uh, David, 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 David. Yeah. Um, 
before that goes, you need to make a request for each letter, or can you request all that you have? Uh, you could re you could request correspondence received for the the February 12, 2018 meeting, and that would cover the, the letters that are under correspondence. Uh, I'm sorry, just for a particular date you said, or a date? Yes. Okay. So we have to. What about the other letters received? One, please, one at a time. Yes. I'm just wondering how we would request all the, the letters that have been sent for you. Uh, you know, a FOIL request is, is, is a request for information. You need to be specific because you can't just have a request, I want all letters that have come to the village. You would probably say, well, that may take 10 years to, to pull all those letters, so you need to be very specific in what you're asking for. How would I know the dates prior to one letter? You, would, you could look at the uh, meeting agendas for previous meetings to see what correspondence uh, you can you can you can request correspondence for a given. I mean, our, our monthly meetings, except for when we have to change it for holiday or the second second Monday of the month, it's quite easy to do that. But the ones that fall on holidays, and then it depends. Now, special meetings, which we sometimes have, that's a that's a different story. We usually don't do correspondence to to our regular meetings. But it's not it's not good to say, can I see all letters that have been sent to the because that, I that will be that will turn specific out. dates then. Yeah. So how can I find out what the agenda is for the meeting? Uh, many of those are on the website, not all. Uh, <laughs> many of those are on the website. Uh, you may have a specific topic you may want to have letters from. Again, you may not want to see every letter that we get because sometimes you get thank yous for piling snow. Uh, and I think it's nice to see those, but I think it may not be what you're interested in. So I mean, focusing what information you have because the gen you make it some big general thing that, that uh, probably the FOIL request would be denied because it's it's cumbersome and again you if you want to see all the letters that are sent to the village that's not something that they okay. easily put together. Are this all the requests FOIL requests either uh, responded to or denied? Yes, we require by law uh, to to respond to them. In a timely manner, or deny them, you can appeal that. The appeal goes to the mayor when there's a FOIL request denial. It's a timely manner, isn't that just? It's a specific time period. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. I, yes. I know this county is. And uh, unless it's an unusual large one that we may, we've, as far as I know, have hit all the deadlines that are required by law. Uh, but the real large ones, would sometimes people ask, I had one request that I had. 300 emails I had to produce on the Deer Manager program and all the reports. And so sometimes it takes a while to figure out who would, all the emails that could have been entailed with that. It took the 30 days to, to respond just because of time it takes to pull some of these things together. Some things are easy, some are a lot harder to get together. Uh, but that's so that our, you know, we know people like to come in the office and request information. We can't, we do want to have other business. And we, that's why the FOIL request gives the village office time to respond to those. Do you really have to acknowledge the receipt of the request? Um, it's, if it's in, it's, we had to fill a form on, so there is, there is a request. Um, and there's a, that stamp, all, everything that comes with the village gets a time, gets a date stamp. I would advise to use emails on my, uh, on the FOIL request by the village clerk. As long as, then there's a record of it. So long as there's a record, then we record stamp it. Yes. There's a record that, that we can then date stamp that, because we have to respond in a certain amount of time. We have to know when it, when the request is made. So if it's an email request, FOIL request? If, if, if Tammy says that. she will take those, then, that, then that's fine. She's yes, but I mean, you're saying we stamp them. Do you, would that be an acknowledgement? Would an email be sent back to me to acknowledge? I, I don't know if Tammy responds to those emails. Uh, I can't answer that she's not here. She's right here. She's here. Is that what's supposed to happen? I don't know. It's transparency. The problem is with you, but something you should be able to hear. I, I, so I, I would assume really she does, but I can't, I can't answer for her. And I understand that, that, but that's what is supposed to happen, is what you're saying. That there, usually we respond. Yeah. Usually there's an acknowledgement of when things are sent in. I would assume the FOIL there is a response, but I can't answer for Kim. You're asking a question I can't answer. No, for. I'm asking the question is what's supposed to happen. Where it comes, who does it? If I send an email FOIL request, should it be acknowledged by email? That's all I'm asking. That you have received the request and the clock starts. I, I assume so. Okay, I assume. I don't have that knowledge right off the top of my 
Yeah, if someone on the board has that, I'd be glad them for them to answer, but I can't answer that. I think it's it would be a common courtesy to respond. Um, I think the legal requirement is within a certain time period, so I don't think there's any legal requirement to respond, but I you know, obviously that's sort of how human beings interact. I would I, I would think that there should be just given what I've gone through this week with my email. Yeah. For I just uh, my, my villager email has been hitting spam and I didn't I haven't received email in three weeks. And I was chasing it down today and finally found it all. So I'll ask time Tammy tomorrow. I mean we generally have a policy of responding when we get you know acknowledging that you had to send something in, whether it's a foil or anything. Okay. Now, whether it's a, an answer to a question is a different story, but acknowledging that you sent something in is a, is a you know, is, a, is the courtesy we typically do. Oh, and I understand. And so if you send me an email, I'll say I acknowledge your email, may not necessarily answer, if there was a question, I may not answer it, or may not answer it at that email. But again, we all tend to respond back saying, yeah, we acknowledge that you sent this request or information or opinion, uh, yeah. I don't know what else to, to say with that. <laughs> yes. Is yes. It, is it possible? Name and address again, please. Sorry, this is, we're yeah. recording this, so just we know who said what. This is with Meyer, 41 Elm Street. Thank you. Um, is it impossible to, to circumvent some of this red tape by just simply posting letters on the website for public consumption? We, we could do that after they're, after they're accepted at a, at a because I mean, I would. I'm really curious about these letters here, and for me to have to go home and to. Follow. Well, most of these are also addressed to the planning board, which becomes a public record if it happens to be for success. But for us to access them, we, you know, if you could put them on the website, that would be wonderful. Then we could just go to the website. We'll, cons we'll consider your request. Uh, yeah, Tom, you always make me look things up. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> so, open meetings law requires rules be set forth as to how records can be accessed and requested. Village law gives village law gives or delegates the authority to the clerk to be the records officer. So it's it's kind of a bit of a catch twenty two. If Tammy, as the village clerk, has established that she will respond and or take requests by email, that's that's entirely in her purview to do that, and it'll be entirely in her purview to decide whether she acknowledges the email or not. But she's required to start her clock when she receives it. Now, as Deb points out, the danger is you don't actually know if she's received it because it's email. Right. If you walk in and she stamps it. And say, hey, can I get a photocopy of that stamp? Yeah, and then that, you know, that, well, to be clear, she's been very cooperative when she requests up in. So I don't mean that, but when you know, we started getting into this discussion about how many there are, right. I'm just curious to know what the mechanism is uh, to know that it's been received and or the clock starts ticking and then you're supposed to respond. So that's really all I want to get at. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, family and everybody in the office has been uh, very cooperative with my uh, and so the clock starts ticking when the records officer, in this case the clerk, receives the request. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it looks like there's going to be a lot of catching up to do, even if it's a, as you said, a more targeted request, perhaps. Uh, that idea about being able to post them takes a lot of the burden off of so I, so I think historically there's been some reluctance in the number of work. Obviously, we know what's going on now, but if you think over the course of 200 years, um, there, there's been some reluctance to publicly post every letter sent in yeah. from every resident. You know, if it's and, and it does happen, if it's a, you know, thank you for helping my mother who slipped and fell kind of thing. Yes, it, technically it's public record, and, and there is some assumption that people understand that what they write now is not private. But at the same time, there's there's the desire to respect the fact that maybe people didn't realize this is going to be. Splashed on the internet, kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. Pure, purely a judgment call. I think if you're uh, email, oh, sorry, Jack, that's 13 South Street. If your email is not uh, accepted by the who you're sending it to, you're automatically um, alerted to that. So if it is sent and you don't get a message, not you know, uh, or message wasn't received or message problems or this or that, 
then I think you can generally assume that it went to who you're uh, sending it to. Unless it ends up in Deb's spam folder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. you got it. <laughs> yeah, but the clock would have been started three weeks ago. Everybody <laughs> already. You're being in trouble. Okay. Um, yeah, so you the other correspondence, we did receive a letter from Tim Hamilton, the chair of the ZBA, um, and I think when we talk about uh, the discussion on the moratorium, we'll, uh, we'll hold that till that, because that's what it's about, uh, uh, his, his view on, on uh, personal view on ZBA, uh, personal view on moratorium, not ZBA. Uh, so that, that we'll cover that under the moratorium discussion. Pers excuse me, Jack has 13 South Street. Is that yes. personal or from representing the ZBA? Um, yeah. yeah, neither is probably <laughs> correct. He was not speaking for the ZBA, okay. but he was speaking in his capacity as the chair. Yes. Right. So there's a, there's a dis an important distinction. Okay. Uh, and it didn't have other members of the ZBA's opinion. Okay, so this was his um, take on things as the chairman. His official position in his seat. Okay. Yes. But then he rendered a personal opinion on the moratorium because he wasn't offering an official opinion as chair of the ZBA. Oh, so there are two opinions? or No, there's one opinion and there's an analysis. Of, <laughs> oh, um, okay. Well, some of the requests, why the request for the Okay, well, it's just probably better to wait until it comes up. <laughs> yeah, that is that 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 We'll we'll cover the content of that letter more and more. We also requested a, a, an opinion from the planning board, so we'll give you those opinions. Okay, um, we have new business. We have the Municipal Solution Contract General Ban uh, for the sidewalk project. Um, you look in the drop box. Consider uh, again using this solutions for our um, bonding uh, work, uh, both bond anticipation notes, long term serial bonds, general financial services, conflicts of interest, and other required disclosures uh, uh, for municipal solutions. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Mm -hmm. All right. Any discussion? With them. Mary's been, she's very responsive. I get her anytime we need to talk to her. Mm -hmm. and, and she's more than willing to come and meet when we have more detailed 
things I personally <coughs> have above imperative yes. for these bands. And bonds too, very And good. bonds. And actually grants for the wastewater treatment plant and the water project. Exactly. Went through them. So they've been extremely uh, beneficial to us. It's a pretty good break, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you may. Name and address, please. Nancy Young, South Street Extension. Yes. Um, with the sidewalk going to Tamarack and stuff, I understand some people's trees might need to be removed for the sidewalk. I was wondering, did those trees get replaced? Uh, are they included in the in the project cost? So the trees that are were going to get removed are they have been removed uh, at this point, and the replacement, depending on where it was in and um, the location of those, some of them are replaced, some of them are not being replaced. Uh, but the landscape, any of the landscape features that were there, we're trying to replace it as closely as we can in the way they weren't before. Uh, and that happened on not just that part of South Street, but, but the parts that are, that are already complete. Uh, but there were a number of trees taken down uh, in the project. Uh, we took those down even though we did didn't originally fund that section uh, because we could use the cost. The DPW staff took that down and we could use that. We have to match part of the cost of this grant, so we were able to use the DPW time uh, to actually take those trees down and use that as part of the match that we did the grant requires. Okay. So the last part of the question was what was your criteria for determining whose trees would be replaced and not? Um, that was done by or the engineering firm who did the design fisher engineering. They assessed all the trees and shrubbery and other other features of the landscape um, and what could be replaced and what wouldn't be replaced. Uh, and uh, so they developed a whole and it was a whole landscape plan part of that project. Uh, and some more involved than others. Yes. Elizabeth Meyer, 41 Elm Street. Um, could I get a little bit more clarification on the um, cost and the finances for the sidewalk project, I'm a little confused. You said that you had $124,000 remaining in the grant funded for the sidewalk project. But what I understand we just passed was a bond for $215,000 to complete the project. So you have, you're afraid to lose the money from the grant, but you're borrowing more money than the grant balance? No, we didn't. We, that was actually for the Sewer. Sewer plant, yeah, wastewater yeah. treatment plant. We haven't, no, no, we haven't approved I'm looking the... At, I'm looking at the two years at old business under the new side. We're not there yet. No, I understand. It all ties in, right? It all ties into the sidewalk, right? Well, this, what we're doing right now is we're, we're approving the contract from our, uh, from, from Municipal Solution that does all our bond and band work and financial analysis, including help we develop water and sewer rates. Okay. For that. So we haven't done the sidewalk, but you are correct. We're taking the leftover funds from the project that we, that the grant we, because when we authorized the three sections to be done, we knew there wasn't, all we couldn't, all the money wasn't spent. You can only spend it on projects that were the original scope of the project. Mm -hmm. And so we decided not to, to turn that money into <coughs> Knowing the critical part of that project to finish that sidewalk, so that's what the that's what the, the bond anticipation <coughs> that we're going to we'll be acting on later uh, arises. So in order to complete it, you're borrowing almost twice Correct. as much Correct. as the existing balance of the bank. Correct. If we approve it, we haven't got that part yet. All right, thank you. Um, Jack Katz, 13 South Street. On the uh, sidewalk projects that were done this season. Um, there was a bid from the contractor, and did that uh, include the engineering work that uh, is done for quality control, or was that also uh, another for expense by the uh, village to do that same process for all uh, for the other two we'll call it village? So the uh, no, the, the contractor's cost is only construction. So there were, basically the thing is broken up into three sections. You have design, which is fisher engineering. You have construction, which is the actual construction of the sidewalks. And then you have observation. And so those are three components of that. 
that came up with the totals that we did for, for putting that in. And that was included within the, the cost, and that was included Correct. within the grant. There was enough funding to do all those processes. No. No, no that's the point. The, Not the whole project. We, we, we were awarded, the grant comes first. Mm -hmm. you apply for a grant, this is what we want to do. New York State, via money from the federal government, says here's $840,000, roughly. Now we have to go and find the people to do the work. Design, construction, observation comes back at a million. And we say, uh-oh, we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. We only have 840. And so that's why we had to go back and break it into pieces and get those rebid. Once we rebid that and got the pieces, DOT came in and said, you can do these sections. Okay, we'll do those sections. Once those sections were completed, we had this little bit of leftover grant money which we've got to decide, if we get there, to old business to decide what to do with this leftover money. Give it back to New York State, or spend it on what they'll let us spend it on, right. which is one place. And then if we're going to do that, then that project will cost whatever it costs, and we have $120,000 to put towards it. Or we can say, we'll pass. Right, but the work that was done that was covered by the grant didn't cover all the expenses for the work. It did cover the 80%. Just the 80 construction. Covered the 80% percent, covered the 80 percent, because we have to match 20. The village oh, okay. has to match 20. Uh -huh. Covered 80 percent of the cost for those sections that were actually done. The scope of the original grant application included all of South Street. And that total cost would have been much more than the grant money award. Right. As it turned out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you matched 20% uh, for whatever it costs. And that's the same process that's going to happen on this as well. Correct. Although everything over the 800, I think it's 15,000, over the 800 and some thousand, either, well, depending on what municipality is doing, they're on the hook for it. So that's why we have to borrow that money. It, there isn't, they won't give additional funds, uh, okay. even though the scope of the project was bigger than it actually ended up funding. Uh, so we did our best guess of what it was going to cost. Uh, they have a whole software package to help them do that. But by the time you put out the bid, and you really only had one contractor bid on it, uh, after going out twice the bid, uh, we ended up getting what we got. But that's because all the rest of the contractors came in too high. So we've had no, there was only one, one con well, there was two the first time. It was the same, they came in too high, that's why we didn't do it. This well, we then broke it up into components. Right. The original one had so, all three, full three right. sections. Right. And we broke it up into four sections and right. we did it. We only got one bit back. Then he did two. And the explanation is, is is it's not big enough for the big companies and it's too right. big for small companies because of all the paperwork that they have to deal with dealing with DOT funding. And if we screw it up, they don't reimburse us. And so that's why you pay a lot for observational costs because if there's a mistake, the DOT doesn't, doesn't care. I mean, they don't care. It's a reimbursable grant. So we get the bill in for $500,000 and they'll send 80% back if they and uh, so you have somebody kind of certifying that everything that's in there is correct. Jack Katz, 13 South Street. Um, is the DOT in charge of sidewalk construction and approvals as far as, you know, standards and what? And are they in charge of street approvals or um, roadways? Well, state, state roads, they are. Just state roads. Right. But they take... Uh, uh, Responsibility for village sidewalks. No, but if you ask, if you apply for a grant, then you have to meet all their criteria. I see. So, yeah. So when we do have done build our build our own versions, we're not following state specs. We're not, you know, we're not following what they're recommending. Right. The okay. same. The same for the school grant funding program. I don't remember if it's Department of Education or Department of Interior, but it's federal money. And then they allocate to the states to award to certain infrastructure projects. 
and they let the states determine how the money is, is allocated and the rules you have to, to follow. So it's, it's a weird hybrid because you're actually applying for federal grant money, but it's New York State that oversees it. And in this case, Albany in its infinite wisdom decided that DOT was going to be the funding arm. And so they want to make sure that they approve and allocate funds for sidewalks that either are on or connect to state roads, which is how we get, you know, a sliver off on the Lake Street and a sliver down on South Street and so on, because it's in proximity to the school but connects to 96. Right, but they don't have authority over um, the other village components. This is just for the grant for the sidewalks, and that's because that's the way you roll that all of it. When you apply for this grant, that's what you agree to. You have to follow all the federal and state requirements. Uh -huh. And they are, as Vicki attests to, they are cumbersome. Oh, they are. They are. <laughs> they are cumbersome. No doubt. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We haven't even got to, to that. <laughs> We're going over the agenda. Um, so if it's something with sidewalks, can we wait till we actually do sidewalks? No, it's, yes. that's not, it was a yeah. one, it's a question that I require no answer now. Just I want to put it in your mind. Okay. okay. If, if, um, if the president of the United States uh, thing goes through where municipalities are, and states are supposed to found 80% of their own roads and infrastructure, all that stuff, what happens, not, don't answer right now, just think about it. What happens in this situation where we're already locked into a bond and anticipating certain money from New York State, which may not be there anymore? Okay. Well, I can answer that. The money's answer. actually there. That's, that's the one thing. We, could, we couldn't proceed unless the money was actually there. That's the good part that the state will protect us. And, and with federal approval, I mean, this thing is, these, these, not just the grants, but the whole content actually gets approved by the federal DOT. Because they're the, they're the ultimate funder of it. You just made the argument for taking $120,000 out of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, they have, the DO, New York State DOT could have said, we're going to put that money somewhere else. They didn't have to leave it in the middle of Trumansburg. They agreed that if we finish the scope of the project, that we could use those funds. So it's, we could have not taken that money, then we would have had to come up with more money to finish sidewalks. Well, one short of it is we want to take the money. Okay, so we have a, we have a motion in a second, I think, on the floor, which we got sidetracked with a bunch of other things. Uh, so, yes, the municipal solution one, I assume, yeah, we have a motion in a second. Yes, to your contract. To your contract. Uh, so all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, I haven't signed yet. So um, we have this draft municipal cooperation agreement for streetlight conversion. And, and Rachel, do you want to cover that? You don't, no, you don't want it. Okay. I, mean, you want to, it. I, I don't understand why we have. Is this just to, for the study itself? This, this proposal is for the study itself. You know? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So I didn't quite understand this, this proposal at all. I mean, is this because if it is doing, Nancy, I think you might know, this is the streetlight conversion stuff. Mm -hmm. What, are you familiar with this collaboration that they're trying to put together? Uh, for Only in the broadest of terms. I know the... The idea is that the city of Ithaca has planned to move forward, and they have the capacity to not only replace their own streetlights with LED, but they are willing to provide that service to other interested municipalities for a fee. I don't know what that fee is, but I get the impression from the research that's been done that it would actually be more cost effective to do it as an intermunicipal project than to have individual municipalities contracting with MESA. But beyond that, other than no more, this is really our point personal to be As I read through that, I was like, well, we only have one contract with NICE. Why would we want to include the city of Ithaca in that? I mean, I, I understand formal shared services thing, and I'm sure that uh, this was one of them that Joe Mariani put forward for the county, I thought. Um, 
And I think it's a, an economy of scale, too, the, the buying power I, I, of it, it makes me nervous that we, we, we lose some of our value in the process. Well, it's not just the yeah, we replace our light bulbs now. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I I don't actually care one way or the other. Um, Has Guy looked at this? Um, I don't think he has. I might want to do that first. <laughs> on whether we only want to take comments that are new, that haven't been put in letters or <coughs> meetings previously since we already have those, read those, heard those. Um, and so if, if that's agreeable to the board, from any public comment, we have our own, obviously, uh, uh, deliberation to do and discussion of it. And really a discussion of the, from the board, but if there's other public comment before we, uh, we get started, that's new information. Uh, it's something that's already been put together that I don't think it's worth all of our time to hear again. I just, let me quick correct you. It's funny my prospects, great Terry and Mabel. You keep referring to the board. You're going to read this letter from the ZBA, correct? And you're yes. talking like the board and you are going to have a discussion about this moratorium. I right. thought you guys were like church and state about this. You wanted nothing to do with this moratorium. Couldn't make any decisions on it. Do not want to. You get put your thoughts out on it. But are you changing your mind that you're ready to comment? Well, we're, on? Here, we're here to discuss it. So okay. if the board wants to take well, action. Well, you don't have comments really on in the past. We need a right. actual comment. So I'm just curious if that's what you would do to it. Okay. The distinction is the moratorium versus the project itself. So we don't want to make comments about a plan that's before the planning board. That would be inappropriate. Uh, the moratorium is an action that's before this board. So obviously we have to. Okay. And so, um, I'll, from the board's perspective, I'll start off saying that I think we have three options. Um, and our last uh, regular meeting, we had a suggestion from Todd Pilato to kick the can out of the road. Uh, two of us are not going to be here, possibly a third board member may not be here. So not even to take up the idea of moratorium to, until April after the election is done and uh, uh, new board members. So that's one, that's one option. The other is to have uh, a moratorium, uh, probably highly uh, focused in its nature because of the time it takes to, to do anything related to zoning revision. Um, and the third, and for a very specific time frame, and the third would be is to not to do a moratorium. The board may or may not want to take on zoning revision in the next six months or whatever, but I see those kind of as our are three options, uh, and um, and I'll start out. I guess my views of, of the moratorium. Um, I would uh, I would support a moratorium not because of the many of the issues that have been raised by the public, but I would do it for two reasons. One that uh, if we would do that, that would, that would stop the current review of 46 South Street, free up uh, Matt. Um, uh, Johnston, our plan and zone code officer, so they can work on, on zoning revision, uh, and that it does force the board to do something in a timely manner. Um, and, and I have been witness to the over 20 years that I've dealt with this village board uh, and boards that it's very difficult to get zoning done unless you have some time frame in mind. So that would be the reason that I would uh, support a moratorium, very focused, very time sensitive. 
uh, probably looking at inconsistencies in definitions, uh, inconsistencies from one part of the, the, the zoning law to the other, to another part, uh, things that our code officer who has been working with this uh, diligently has, has identified, but not a broad spectrum. We can't do a comp plan in nine months. Uh, there's no way to do that, so we would have to have a very targeted, very time limited one. So I would be willing to support something like that. But that's uh, that's my my opinion uh, uh, for a reason that we could consider, but I think we could then allow the board to do it. Uh, heavily encourage them to do it by a time frame in mind and have the professional help of our planner to, to actually work with doing that. Uh, short of going out and hiring someone else to help with uh, uh, with doing that. So I'll open up to other board members if we want to take public comments from the public that before there's any kind of deliberation or three options, uh, get anything that might be new. So any comments from other, other board members? Do you have a letter you could do that? Um, I will, but I won't no. do that yet. Okay. We've got any comments from the board members. Uh, we're getting some initial comments from the board members. I think the board are thinking about it. Which is good. I'm not going to, we're not going to take any right now. This is just for the board itself that's thinking about it. And uh, if they don't want to say anything, then we can, we can take comments from the public and, and put it into uh, the director of the CBA chair's uh, comments. Okay, I'll jump. Go ahead, go for it. Um, I personally do not believe that we should do a moratorium. I do believe that um, I do believe that there are a number of safeguards and and gates that have to be passed, and I believe that um, this entire that the, the um, entire conversation has jumped from from what can we do to stop progress um, without regard to where we've been and where we're going. Um, I think that we've heard a number that, I, I, and I have to tell you, I have been swayed by certain things. And I do think that um, all of the input that we receive has been, been particularly helpful and, and articulate. Um, I really would like to thank Bill O'Connor for his last letter. It was excellent. Um, I'm bringing out each of those points. But all of those points are still part of our zoning, and there is nothing saying today that that zoning board is saying yes. It's the it's assumption. Planning. Pardon? Planning. The plan, excuse me. It's been the assumption of the <coughs> conversation that they're going to say yes. I would like to see the process work itself out. <coughs> I mean, so I think I'll reserve judgment for the moment, but I will just give my reaction, which is one, I'm sort of surprised that this is your approach. Um, and two, just to say, you know, my initial reaction to a moratorium was that, you know, that's that's great. It's a very contentious issue. Um, it sort of releases the pressure and, you know, maybe a sort of relax and regroup moment for everyone. Um, but as it happens, that's an explicitly illegal justification for moratorium. Um, and I think at this point, I'm not categorically against it. I <coughs> certainly would need a more specific plan for review. I mean, if I was going to actually vote, which obviously isn't what you're asking for. Um, so, yeah, not, not categorically against it, but certainly I would want to see... <coughs> I'm not ready to support it. I, I think it's just, you have to go into that, I think, with a really, um, an understanding of the legal implications that I don't think I have, certainly. Um, so I would need to know more. A lot more, actually. I, um, I am, at this point, not satisfied by the legal arguments that I've heard. Um, 
that all seem to be contradictory. I mean, I, I think for me to be satisfied, the more important was possible even, let alone a good idea, I would have to, you know, sit down with David, and, I think, for some time, really. Because, I mean, I think the legal implications are, are astonishing. Not to mention the, the implications for our planning process, which I think are essentially just uh, damaging as well. But I'll leave it there rather than just rambling my thoughts as I go. I would like to ask questions of our attorney because I'm not convinced that it's the best course. Can you speak up? I'm not convinced that a moratorium is the best course of action for us, so I'd like to also have an opportunity to speak to our are coming up, this is an issue that is publicly contentious, uh, and the elections are really inappropriate any to sort of, you know, to at least get an idea of what public is going on. Just a good point. So for my part, and I've just been struggling because I made the mistake of telling somebody once that everything is black and white, you just have to hone it down to individual issues and figure out what you think. Um, we have to rethink that. I think you told me that at least twice. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make this the third. Um, there's obviously a lot mixed in here. So if I try to break it out, you know, I'm not philosophically opposed to moratoria. I think it's a tool that municipalities have available to them to use. The question is, why, are, why would we use it? And I can see three reasons that we would consider. One is because we believe that there is a proposed project that this municipality wants to try to stop. It's a losing position, a losing argument, but it's one we could take. The second one is somewhat compelling, which is we believe that we need a broad review of our existing zoning and land use laws and that we should revise and rewrite the comp plan and then let that inform a new zoning document. I think that that is a good, that is probably something that we want to consider doing, but a moratorium, I don't believe we can do that in the time constraints of a moratorium. I think to do justice so that we're not 10 years down the road with a different group proposing something different and having residents mad at us because we didn't do a good job with the last comp plan and zoning rewrite. So to do that process justice, I think we need 18 months, two years. And there's no example in New York State law that I'm aware of of a moratorium being held up for that law. The third option is the one you suggested, Marty, which is a moratorium so that we can do a smaller, more focused review of inconsistencies in the specific zoning. I believe that rewriting zoning without readdressing the comp plan is tricky, but if we simply say there are just some contradictions in terminology we want to clarify. <coughs> but that then leads me to say that doesn't require a moratorium to do. So how many moving parts is that? Six. So that's where I guess I'm, again, not opposed to moratorium as a, as a tool. I think it is, it is a bit of a blunt instrument, but it is a tool available to us. I'm just not sold on it yet. Um, we don't need it to fix inconsistencies. And we can't get the broad review done in time to meet a moratorium deadline. And that leaves us with only the third reason why we would impose the moratorium. Which is a loser. Mm -hmm. So I would need at least another night or two to 
So we uh, read or summarize the graphs. Yeah, I won't read it. I won't read Tim Hamilton's uh, letter the entirety of it because it's long. But he uh, he specifically addressed the um, TVNA report and um, he um, drew about probably ten or so direct comments that he placed in that, um, and um, I, those I can probably read, because they are, each one is relatively short, um, and it, uh, it refers to the TBNA report, uh, page one has highly, has remained largely dominant and un, uh, dormant and untested. Now, test the 2008, post-2008 law reliance on outdated but uh, substantial and important uh, companion laws. He basically uh, said uh, untested means wrong and insufficient mm -hmm. judges whether the law uh, or code is outdated. Uh, appeal to the contra to, to appeal to, on page two, appeal to... Appear. Uh, appear to contradict, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, are the positions in the code contradictory or not? Does the supposed appearance make it reality? Is there a true legal problem with our zoning code? Uh, that's his kind of response to the appear to contradict. Uh, page two appeared, and these are the quotes out of the, of the TVNA report, appear to lack full clarity and understanding of their respective roles authority, procedures, and protocols related to them. I don't believe these, I don't, I don't remember being interviewed or confronted about any ignorance, about my ignorance of those things. Uh, have all the proceedings over the past 10 to 12 years been observed and judged to be incomplete or insufficient? Have our decisions and judgments been consistently overturned by uh, people proving the inability to provide adequate uh, service to the dwellers? These are questions we have put forth. Page 7, again, quote from the TVNA report, Signi uh, significantly more permissive uses and development than ever been seen previously. This is inherently wrong if the duly elected village board determined that the previous zoning was possibly too restrictive. Uh, disagreement does not mean inappropriate. Uh, page seven makes innumerable uh, residential building types and building sizes allowable without special permit. Uh, the author cited the requirement of site plan review but dismissed the lack of zoning board of approval. Site plan review can actually provide as much or more review uh, than the zoning board can. Both uh, processes allow for thorough investigation, public comment, and the establishment of conditions. Um, so this is, I mean, there's a series of a whole bunch of these point-by-point point things, and if we make this public, it's probably easier to do that. But I would like to, uh, to comment on his summary, okay. It is not my authority to make judgment concerning the moratorium. However, it is my humble opinion that the document presented by TVNA uh, appears to have a single purpose to dictate to the village exactly what should be allowed and where it should be allowed because of the because the present zoning law is not restrictive enough to be particular for their particular desires. The right of individual landowners appears to be less significant when compared to the right of other landowners. And that's his final comment. We also asked the planning board to make uh, comments about the moratorium. Uh, they declined to make official uh, comments on it because they're in the middle of reviewing a project that uh, obviously uh, uh, could be affected by uh, a moratorium and change in zoning that happened to be the case. So there wasn't any comments from the planning board. Uh, but we had we requested comments from both, uh, both boards. Um, so does the board want to entertain any public comment? I would just like, I want to say something more. Indeed, it's true. I, mean, I, I will no longer, next month is my next, is my last meeting, so 
it probably doesn't matter what I think about this, but I, it is true that if, if I were going to be on the board longer, I would want to think seriously, talk to a lawyer. My gut feeling about this has, has been that this, this suggestion of a moratorium, I understand that some, some serious thought and consideration and a, a lot of, um, like Debbie said, really well-worded commentary. However, my feeling is that the strategy is being used to temporarily prevent change while working, while hoping to work on laws that permanently prevent change, and I, and I disagree with that, that use of the strategy. So do we want to hear new comments from the public? I said this, we should. Okay. Uh, so uh, can, we we said, Trump, can we limit it to 15 minutes? Um, so that would be five, we would allow five people. Yeah. To so, speak. so we have a constraint. That's if they use all three minutes. Thank if they all use all three minutes. Yeah. Yep, I can. can yep. Okay, so we have, all right, we'll start from the front to the back. So we'll go this way and keep working our way. We've been doing a lot of things in the back. We finally have some hands in the front. I don't have time, and I have questions okay. for, for you to clarify some of what you said. Maybe there's a little bit more. Maybe there's a little bit more. Maybe there's a little bit more. Um, when you speak about legal consultation, I would assume that you would not, if you decide to move forward with the moratorium, you absolutely would not do that without legal consultation Correct. to be certain you covered all bases. Um, some of the reasons <coughs> based on case laws where moratoriums have been overturned by the Supreme Court. So it is very, very tricky business. So to be specific, I mean, you the, would not... The draft law would be, would be crafted by the attorney. Okay. And when you speak about um, um, small focused review and the time constraint, what timeline are you talking about? Well, most moratoriums run anywhere from 6 to 12 months, and 12 is really pushing it. We did have a moratorium when I was on the board in the past. Uh, because there was a, a, a pending uh, adult <coughs> entertainment center that was going to go on Main Street. And you can't outlaw adult entertainment, but you can say where it could be, where it can't be. And so the moratorium was, was in place to, to, to look at that part of our zoning. We took us a while to get through that. We did that. We allowed, you, get, you can't outlaw it, but you can regulate where it could be and where it can't be. So that's exactly what the, what the village board did. So it was a very targeted, but 12 months is, is really pushing it. And it really depends on if there a current project that was stopped, how long the, 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 the developers will wait, and they uh, can push to uh, uh, to you know, limit the amount of time uh, and actually get the court to stop the moratorium if it appears it's going too far. And, and I know you're separate from the planning board, and right. Deb spoke to allowing the process to happen through process. The planning board has had the application, the full application, for uh, less than a month. Um, and we've not seen them in action in public address specifics that were in that to the community. Is there a point that you could speak to this, I don't know where the planning board has to, where, um, uh, I'm not sure what the legal term is, that in the review of it, that they're so conflicted about what they're trying to apply from the zoning and from the comprehensive plan, that they say, we just can't do this, it's, um, that they can't make the decision? No, they have to make a decision. <laughs> they don't have to, they have to make a decision. And, and part of it, I mean, there's a various things they have to review and make decisions on. The biggest one is the uh, is looking at the, the seeker laws for State Environmental Quality Review Act, because they're required by law to, to do that. So that's a that's a very big one. That kind of sets what you know what the parameters are uh, moving forward with the project. Okay. Thank you. Yes. But they have, unfortunately do have to make it. Well, no, they need to make a decision, but it's sort of like, is it, can it be a hung jury? No. Type thing? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's either it's a yes or no. Thank you. And it could be you need four board members, not just three. You don't need, you, in some cases, you need a super majority if the county planning weighs in, which they will on a project like that. And they'll make recommendations, and those aren't followed, then you have to have a super majority to overrule what county planning has put forth. But usually it's a simple majority, so three, three of the five members. Thank you. So we have comments down here. So you had your hand up? 
Yes. Yeah, name and address, please. Uh, my name is David Breeden. I live at 91 East Main Street. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Village Board. I wanted to comment on TVNA's demand for a moratorium. Their presentation did not focus on moratorium, nor its impacts to the village, nor how current land use laws are actually in place to protect the village from unhealthy development. I wanted to take a few moments to do that tonight. In the New York State Division of Local Government Services, land use moratorium, land use moratorium document, there are five conditions that must be met to lawfully impose a land use moratorium. It states, in holding moratoria to be lawful, the cases have suggested five key elements that are requisite for a legally defensible moratorium. The land use moratorium should, one, have a reasonable time frame as measured by the action to be accomplished during the term, two, have a valid public purpose justifying the moratoria or other interim, interim enactment, three, address a situation where the burden imposed by a moratorium is being shared substantially by the public at large, or strictly adhere to the procedure for adoption laid down by the enabling acts, and five, have a time certain when the moratorium will expire. Item two is perhaps the most important item to ascertain in your deliberations. Is there a bona fide problem with any of our existing laws or our comprehensive plan that necessitates imposing a moratorium to address. My feeling is no. It is very important to understand that the system of local land use laws work together to provide protections to residents and businesses in the village. Is there a grave risk to the public in the current body of land use law and the system it represents? TBNA has asserted there is a high level where actually it appears much narrower. There is some narrow risk in terms of buildings that are not required to go through site plan review, not abiding by the spirit of the zoning law, such as new single family homes. But the proponents of the moratorium have clearly stated that they favor more single family homes and that their concern is about larger development projects, not whether the people building individual homes are likely to cause problems. As pertains to larger developments, the system of land use laws provides clear means of protecting the environment, community character, and all other areas in which land use laws are allowed to extend protection. As a body of law, Truman's Burgs, land, local land use laws do not fail to protect the citizens. Furthermore, it can't be forgotten that a moratorium has real consequences for development and investment in our community. A moratorium would impose burdens on some individual citizens who may want to develop in our village in the meantime. I urge the village board to carefully weigh these matters and determine in an objectively a way as possible whether the proposed moratorium is a wise use of the power of the village to limit the rights of citizens in this case, or whether what is needed is a better understanding on the part of our citizens of where in the review process the protections that they desire may already exist. Okay, your time is up. Thank you. May I provide copies to the yes, board? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your hand is up. Yes. And we'll the second row. Kathy Clever, 31 Wood Street. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. I didn't hear it. Kathy Clever, 31 Wood Street. <coughs> thinking about moratorium and how it might play out. So I'm going to ask a few questions. For many of these questions, the answers are no, but I don't think they're clear to many in the village. First, what's actually being proposed? I'm, I understand that TBNA is asking for a moratorium on major development. What does this mean? New no new subdivisions? No building of new dwellings on existing lots? No variances to the current zoning ordinance? No building at all? Second, when would the moratorium be lifted? TBNA's proposal recommends that it lasts until the completion of revisions to or a complete redrafting of the zoning ordinance, the subdivision regulations, and land use and development law. Is there anything else? What about the comprehensive plan? <coughs> From past experience, I think we'd be looking at years until a more, such a moratorium would be lifted. The moratorium, whatever it ends up being, ended up being, 
would have a number of consequences, intended and unintended. According to my interpretation, the goals of tDNA analysis of tDNA analysis are twofold. First, to allow no major developments until any moratorium is lifted, and second, to ensure the ongoing character of the village, whatever that is, for the foreseeable future. Unfortunately, there are a number of consequences. Obviously, a moratorium would put a damper on any new development or investment in the village. It would lead to a stagnation of the character of the village, at least during the moratorium period. The 46 South Street project could be delayed indefinitely, possibly dropped. A moratorium would delay and suppress all the benefits that would accrue with development in Tiber, namely growth in the school population, an increase in affordable housing, an increase in senior housing, both affordable and otherwise, an increase in single family housing, and finally more business downtown thanks to all of the above. All of these points have been commented upon in previous meetings, but they're, re they're repeating, I think. In conclusion, I'd like to ask what's actually the problem with our current ordinances. It's true there are some flaws in the current zone ordinance, specific, some unclear and illogical definitions, also some vague instructions. None of these rises to the level of requiring a moratorium on development. I believe the other perceived problems with our laws are really opinions by some who want to suppress development. Our planning board exists to review and work with potential developers. We do, in fact, have a zoning Five provision. seconds, please. Sorry. I'm sorry? Yeah, five seconds. Okay. Uh, it's time for us to celebrate the arrival of the neighbors rather than focusing only on possible problems. We need to put our faith in the planning board who are able to interpret the intent of the current laws and divide value development in the interest of all of those who live in the village. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank you very much. The time of the three minutes is hard. So second row, are there people who want to comment in the second row? Have to be specifically more yes, that's all we're talking about right now. Yeah. Something that hasn't been already said or. No. <laughs> Third row. Yes, name and address, please. So it's going to be new. <laughs> Not a rehash. Correct? Well, I'm, I'm just done. Right, yeah. It's her three minutes. Just give me my phone. <coughs> my name is Paula Burr, again, 325 Pennsylvania Avenue. I have a letter prepared and signed by 122 people from 74 households. The letter says, and I'm not going to read the whole letter. And I have, I'll provide copies to the Hulk Village Board as well. Thank you. Right, I'll give them my three minutes to come to the front. We'll give you, we'll give you a few minutes. We'll give you a couple more for uh, moving around the room. Yes. I also want to tell you that this letter was signed by 122 people between yesterday, the Saturday morning, and today. And it says, we the undersigned believe an immediate land use or moratorium is needed to temporarily suspend all major land development approvals in the R1 district. While the village takes time to comprehensively consider and adopt amendments and changes to its zoning map and ordinance, as well as other relevant land use regulations, such action is needed to address the very real concerns being raised by citizens regarding the current ordinance's impact on residential neighborhoods. By proceeding with the land use moratorium in the R1 district, village government will have time to better align its residential zoning regulations with the 2008 comprehensive plan. I'm just going to highlight on the second page, and this is, uh, you can see it's on two pages. Um, after a long, quiet period, Germansburg stands at a critical juncture where major development is imminent and on the horizon. Because of its current zoning law, the village's entire R1 district is more vulnerable than it has ever been. Now is the time for decisive action and direction on the part of village government to take the necessary steps to create zoning that builds on the 2008 comprehensive plan and is designed to, one, reflect the village's residential growth goals for both new market rate and affordable housing, while at the same time preserving and foster traditional neighborhood development paths. Prioritize new traditional development, path development 
neighborhood development to mirror historic village patterns. Specify exactly how many buildings are allowable per lot in specific residential areas. Provide clear and concise definitions, enabling consistent and incontestable interpretation. <coughs> Provide clear parameters and requirements for growth in new and existing neighborhoods concerning the creation of both new roads and new recreation and open space. Provide for a set variation of residential lot sizes and building types with clearly specified standards, limits, and characteristics tied specifically in that location. And specify optimal land uses for large land parcels in residential areas. Mixed use, multifamily housing plan development. I don't think there's a single person to address some members of the, of the village board who have said that there are people resistant to change. I don't think that's correct. I think everybody who has taken an interest and investment in this is invested in growth and change in this community for the best and wants the best land use and the best character that is compatible with their existing conditions and where they live. Nobody is resistant to change. Everybody wants the best change for the future. And TVNA is not wholesale saying stop the future, stop the train. Uh, revise everything in the village. No, let's take pause, let's be careful, let's create development that is appropriate for the future. The truth of the matter is, is that we have, from the developers who come to 40, from, through 46 South Street, they have raised their awareness. First they came with smaller buildings with four, four units in them. Then they came with a building with 40 units in them. Surprise, surprise. Now we see, we saw the range of what's allowable in the early district. So I think people have woken up and people are concerned. I think this is authentic concern and I hope that the village will take it seriously. Please refrain from clapping, booing, seeing another Okay, anybody else in the third row? Three minutes. Okay, Jack Katz, 13 South Street, once again. Um, now, as far as uh, the legalities go, I would think that this issue has been in the forefront for a while and that members of the board would uh, have familiarized themselves with some of the, the issues that a moratorium or, you know, uh, basic development involve. And I think it's imperative that you uh, speak with the attorney and get his opinion on a moratorium because basically it's settled law in New York State that you can impose a moratorium even after an application has been submitted. Now a lot of money has been spent on this particular project but that doesn't mean that you're, you have to go along with what is been proposed because the fear of getting sued, although genuine, by a developer or anybody else, is really not enough reason to disregard a lot of flaws that are currently in the system as it stands. Like the zoning, many of, I've heard a couple of you at least, maybe three of you, say that there are flaws in the zoning. And that with a project of this size and scope, there should be some correction of those flaws if indeed you know you see them as being necessary, and many people do. Um, now you said you didn't have to do a moratorium in order to uh, change some of the provisions in the zoning. So are you willing to legislate, which is what you would do, I would imagine, certain laws or revisions in order to make changes? Is that a, a possibility that you would be able to do? And also there was a zoning revision committee, and there still is, I believe, and they've kind of been on hiatus, but it would be uh, nice to hear what they've developed, you know, as far as their, you know, projections and, and uh, decisions about what would be uh, a good pattern or a good way to proceed with rezoning. 
And if it was open to the public, I think that um, the public doesn't have to comment on, you know, at these meetings, but they can at least hear what's going on. So basically, a moratorium would just be, would just be to uh, take a breath because this is a, a huge project and it could set a precedence that will be irreversible. So anyone in the back row, no clapping, please. Yes, name and address, please. Ben Darkler, 32 Wig Street. Um, so it's clear that our neighbors in CBNA are opposed to this project and are using all the tools that they have at their disposal to try and stop it, including calling for moratorium. It makes perfect sense. I think I would be doing this if I were in their shoes. Um, I think it's important for this board, though, to look at the broader picture. Smart development that can help support our services, our main street businesses, our school district. It's critical for our village. I worry about the signal it would send to developers that want to invest in our community when we entertain the idea of a moratorium that would block their development rights when 122 concerned citizens of a village of 1,800 make a request to the board. The, developer, um, the developers for this project will have spent over a year working with the village by the time this is all said and done. If that year of effort is blocked by a sudden moratorium, I would expect other developers to be rather gun-shy about investing in this village. We already have protections of site plan review process. We don't need a moratorium that can harm our ability to develop our village in a smart and beneficial ways. I also noticed in the budget section later in this meeting, there's a line item for planning. If we want to put our time and effort and money into that, I think that would be well-deserved rather than spending time considering more for it. Thank you. You already had your three minutes, Jack. Sorry. All right. Back row. That's what our rules say. So I you get one shot. Probably. Back row. Any other comments? Or the side, we're kind of coming around. I yeah, do want to leave you on, Bill. I'm good. Thank you. Yes. What, what? I have, I have okay. a, it's, okay. it isn't important. I just have a request for the board. I would like to request that those of you on the board, if you, if you have any signs in your yard, to please remove them. Because I think that it's a, it's a community People should make their decision, and you who are on the board um, should probably not be trying to sway public opinion. So if you have signed, it is a request, like moratorium now or affordable Trumansburg or anything like that, you have signed in your yard, please consider removing them. Thank you. I was just going to say thank you, Marty. Actually, I think your conversation tonight was a perfect segue into the election season. I want everyone just to take in every single person who's running for office here and what they've said. Make sure you tell your friends and everybody else, this is our future. Thank you, Marty, for making everyone finally speak up and say their piece. And everyone, oh, get Ben Carter back there, he's running too, so now that we got it all clear, just make sure you keep that in mind on election day. You're supposed to address the board only, not individuals. Uh, just remind you that. Oh, thank you. Well, I said thank you to you. I appreciate yeah, that. So However, yeah. you're supposed to address the board. Not yeah. Thank you. Any other comments from the public on moratorium? Yeah. So I started this discussion with three options, and actually there's a fourth option. If we want to table this to another meeting, if we want to set up a meeting with our attorney uh, to investigate more about the moratorium, uh, so, so we could add that as a, as a fourth uh, possible option for us to consider. I don't know if anybody has any strong opinion on number one, do we take the can and let the election go by and wait till April if the new board in place would like to, to take this up? Uh, consider a very narrow uh, scope time frame uh, moratorium. No moratorium, or let's, let's have some time for the board to think about it more and uh, confer with counselor. Um, so I see those as four, unless somebody has some other options they want to try. I'd certainly like to review it legally more. And to Jack's point about us having been thinking about this for months now, um, which I think is, is important. But the difficulty here is that it is established that we have the power to do this. As you say, it's settled. Lots of municipalities can do it. We can actually pass pretty much any law we want, as long as all of 
let's vote on it. Whether or not that law stands up to legal, you know, the law survives, and whether or not we are liable for damages as a result of that. Those questions are more complicated and more difficult to parse through. Uh, to me, that's really the question. And secondarily, well, I guess actually the primary question would be what the, what the end goal would be. So I see, I mean, if we accept Burden's um, characterization yeah, of the three possible purposes, uh, in the event that we do a small, narrow moratorium, for those of you who are against Hamilton Square, and that's why you're here, and that's why you're advocating for a moratorium, that probably doesn't stop Hamilton Square. So that's basically a corrective action to fix small inconsistencies in the zoning. So that doesn't, Hamilton Square is not on the table there. For those of you talking about a more, a broader plan, which I think is Paula, um, to revise the comp plan of the zoning, that's a bigger thing. That becomes legally very, very difficult uh, to do in a time frame that the courts would, you know, would accept as reasonable. Um, and I say that not because I have some conclusion, some conclusion at the end of this, whether it's good or bad, but just to point out that the issue is not as complicated or is not as simple as we want this. I think it's easy when you have a vested interest in any project to see everything through the lens of this achieves the result I want. Um, and I think for those of us here, the burden is to try and remove our own interest from that and see it objectively. And that is, at least for me, extraordinarily difficult. Um, especially being a non-lawyer to address legal matters. But I'll leave it there. So do we want to just sit on it to we have a meeting scheduled the 21st? Um, does someone make a motion to not consider it, put the can down the road, consider it, or whatever. You know, those are kind of the other three active options that are out there if we're not going to speak to our attorney. I think we were considering we probably definitely should have a private session with our attorney. I mean, I would appreciate Unless we're not to explain what makes it simple. I'm certainly not there yet. In my in my that's the first thing. I don't have any any objection to discussing the options with, with our attorney as a board so that he can inform the board of what's involved and give us his opinion. I'm unwilling to speak with the attorney and I I just ask that it be a shared conference call and not in an in-person um, in person meeting. It's hard Simply, to... I just can't. I know you can't. I just can't. I can't. The rest of us may need to try to cut the number of phone same, calls. Uh, yeah. So is that a direction that... Sure. So we won't make any decisions tonight one way or another, but
So, um, that will bring us to old business. Now, we do have the bond resolution authorizing the construction of sidewalks in the middle of Juniper. And uh, I guess if you are going to leave, if you can kind of leave quietly, that would be great. So that we can uh, finish the rest of our business. All right. Um, So, um, the municipal solution developed the bond resolution for authorizing the reconstruction of sidewalks in or for the building of Williamsburg, Conference County, New York, a maximum estimated cost of $342,869, and authorizing the insurance of $219,000 of serial bonds of said village to pay part of the cost of the so the two hundred eighteen thousand dollars is what's remaining after the amount that we have left over from the rent. Correct. Okay. Up to that amount. It may actually be less than that, but up to that. Very kind of just figured it a little high because the same for cost that we covered that we didn't anticipate. Are you moving it? Um, I would. I would. Uh, I would entertain a motion to move this resolution. I could do it. I could make the motion to uh, do the bond resolution for uh, the sidewalk, completing the sidewalk project as presented by uh, Mr. Solution. Second? Yeah. So, I'll question the serial bonding. Did she didn't see it? Did she give up? Yes. I thought I put it in. Actually, we have it. Five years. It was, five years. Yep, it's five years. What's the interest rate? They don't know. I, they, they won't, won't know yet. yet and so, um, I guess not it. Um, they won't know until they put it out to bid, which I think is April 24th. Yeah, 77, yeah. Seven, seven, something like that. And it's going to be using around two and a half. So, no, I don't have the payment. No, I okay. So I have a silly question not necessarily related to this. We keep bonding on all these things. What's this new to our credit rating? Okay. We have two plenty of bonds. water and sewer bonds are held separately. Okay. There's what is what's called a constitutional debt limit for municipalities. Okay. So this would go against that water and sewer bonds. Okay. Because it's not tax base. All right. I just was wondering. It seems like every time we have spent money, two of them right. will be paid off in the next two years. Two. General. Two ranks general. I think they're water. Water. No, I think that, yeah, they're, 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 they are the water. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying, you know, just in debt in general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, Name address, please. Uh, Jack Hats, 13 South Street. I'm wondering if you don't have um, an interest rate, how much can it vary? Can it vary a percent? Can it vary two? And how much will that accrue further down the line to the uh, termination when the bond is paid off? Can you vote on something that you really don't know how much you're going to be paying for? All the time. Well, the, the problem is the, the process has a series of time constraints in it. So we have to do this phase, and it gives us, it gives 30 days. It, it, it's, it has to go through like, kind of all the different Well, because this, because this is a ban, it does not need to go through the 20-day estoppel period. So we just have the 30-day premise of referendum. Risk referendum. So um, I was looking on my calendar. She told me the date um, that it would be that I would have to be available. So um, March twenty second, actually, is yep the day it goes out for bid. And so you don't you don't don't know. I mean, you can't do it in advance. So you mean you, you bid on? No, you put it out, and people will banks. Banks. 
really. Yeah. Well, well bid on what their what their interest basically what their interest rate is going to be. Okay, so this is in a, like this just uh, gives the board permission to put that out, yes. and whether or not it's accepted or rejected, it will be accepted. And I don't blame you. I don't mind. I'm just wondering if it's uh, more exact when that uh, time period is up. I mean, as far as uh, your interest and your payment. Well, before we accept that we, yes, you know what it is, but you can't in advance of this know exactly. It sounds like it must be going for ratings of ours, bonds going up right now, right. two and a half percent is likely to be the rate. But sure, I mean, they change in the half hour, the rates change. So, you know, but we it's impossible to know exactly. So, luckily, we have a very good bond, we have a very good rating. And it's only for five years. It's a five year. So. The sidewalks hopefully last a lot longer than five years. Without a <laughs> Or totally fall. Um, okay. So, yes. any other discussion? Because we, I, I moved it. Right. Mm -hmm. Got that. Okay, if not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Stay in passes. And there's something for you to sign. Nope, can't sign up again. Um, so we have quotes mm -hmm. for the new boiler. Correct. The village hall. Correct. And um, they are approximately 11,000, 17,000, and 15,000. <clears throat> Amazing. Somebody upload these. I have access. Yeah, some I can't get. And these are ones I did. I only have um, Adobe Pro regular. Um, I do want to. You can be one of them to look at. Okay, the three quotes. Right. Oh, gosh. Um, HSC is the lowest. was HSC, and I have, if you want to see, I actually have what they, what they were going to put in. Yeah, that's something I've seen it. Okay. I just want, I mean, if I don't know what the other guys, they could be putting in them. Whether right, they could put exactly. in and that's all we got with quotes from the other ones, Debbie. So we want to table this to look at the Well, I mean, they, they, they do tell you, so, so, so Hubbard says it's a, 286,000 BT. I mean, that's what you can measure on. And HSC is 200,000. HSC is a smaller size. Right. So, I, I, yeah, I don't feel like I'm very unqualified to understand why one is better than the other or why. Mm -hmm. I mean, we spend more if we can spend less. I'm trying to bring up that. Yeah, I'd actually like to look at the Okay. The vision that's potentially part of right. our right. energy yeah. so that exactly. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, it's more than 90,000. And the house course is, is the biggest one. Yes, you have a comment, Matt. I'm just curious if um, non fossil fuel alternatives were considered. You know, you consider air source replacements um, that are much higher efficiency, lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Lower energy use, longer lifespans than traditional. I think water. we asked this, the typical heating contractor. Quotes yeah, we didn't. Yeah. Yeah. This was, we need to replace that boiler. Nobody said we need to go look at efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> I I'm just saying that's maybe, what happened. If, if, if you so choose to table and want to explore that option, okay. that's the information. Okay. Yeah, I think we should 
Okay, yeah. and all three of these are different, are different yeah. um, equipment. And just an FYI, three times this year we've come in to a very cold office. Yeah. So I'm just saying, that's fine, whatever you want to do, but we need to make it. It's not the way for it. Because yeah. okay. we've been trying next winter. We've been trying to do this for two years. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll table this possibly to the 21st. I don't think it's on the least. But if we're going to okay. other options that may, may or may not be. Do you have any suggestions on how to approach that? I do. I know several contractors on that can make necessary contacts, bids, or uh, explanations of different technologies available. In the can we talk about that Wednesday? Sure. When you come in? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we were looking at similar kinds of things, and Tom Meyer is actually was helpful to us, so I did, I took a percentage of the sidewalk and it ended up being a dollar. Okay. 
I mean, by the time I got through it, it was just what's oh, all significant. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I meant for that, for that cycle. Wow. Well, for that piece of cycle. Um, so, <laughs> we all know James. <clears throat> So I have guys' comments, and now we have the, the amount, so we can put that in. Okay. Okay, I mean, if you, yeah, if you have, it's on our agenda. The other parts of the chain is a mirror. We've got a placeholder set, it will be available if it can't be available, so okay. we have to see in two weeks. Good. Okay, good. All right. Um, so it brings us to budget 2018-19. Where did I have that? I don't know that. Oh, okay. It's been a long day. So I guess tonight, um, I guess it depends on tonight how much do we want to, do we want to list what info we still want or need to get? By, by the 21st meeting, I should have uh, January 4th. So that'll give us um, workers' comp numbers. I think Herman numbers, Herman numbers are in there, and um, the Hartford numbers will be in there. By the 21st, we have all the Hartford Um, I think I have all the. I'm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's water is you know they, everything else is done except for really coal. I, I have most of the expenditures. What I need to do is I need to I need to concentrate on the spread. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Tom, Tom was out on Monday, Monday, what's the same Tom was out Wednesday and Friday, so he doesn't have this. I, Matt, I worked with Matt um, on his, so that's done. Chief gave me his, summer rep, but I never, I didn't hear from you, so I just went ahead and... I, yeah. Oh, you have other numbers, but I just went ahead and did what was on there. Uh, fire and EMS are in there. Uh, Tammy and I talked about what we were going to do for next year. I think that's it, right? So, right. Then, I mean, if you don't have water, I mean, you have DBs out here with less water and sewer for the 21st. Actually, I probably have less than the, the first 21st. I'm not going to be. I know you're not going to be. I will have everything you need. I'll give it to you so we can have it for the 21st. Okay. Right. But uh, I want some room to play with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're not putting anything up. I don't know if you want to talk about for Matt's because he came. I don't know if you want to give him a few minutes. Really gave him a No? No. On the revenue side, yes. do we have, will we have sales tax estimate from the county? Now you should be able to fill in a lot of these revenue lines. 
Um, yep, I can. Well, most of them are filled in. The revenue lines. Oh, you mean as as, as proposed? You mean? But okay. Sure. Yep, I can definitely uh, do that. Get all the fire yep. and this. Mm -hmm. from town. Yep. Interest rentals. Sure. So we probably don't need to go out with insurance quotes this year. No. Last year we went through that. Yes. Okay. So I would just check on the garbage one. That's probably okay. a contract that's sitting there. We can, have we gotten our external people letters? The yeah, the because I sent those letters out. The only one we did get that is Termansburg um, Community RAC, and they only want five hundred dollars. Okay. Um, I mean, they're only asking for five hundred dollars right. because of that conversation we had, where we encouraged them to ask for something so that we right. it could start in the budget. Okay. So um, the other ones, I'm, I'm sorry, I already sent out the letters, and they're supposed to have their answers back. I think. By the 15th or the 19th. So you can have, um, but go with the 21st. Yeah. Not a bargain, but it's not. It, yep. So. Well, I, I think I'm a little worried about the checks for EMS and fire are due on the 15th, and I've gotten contracts back from the town of Ulysses, but I've gotten contracts or the from Hector or Covert. And I'm assuming they're sending them with their check. They won't be tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. But they had they've all had them since the first of December. It would be a good time to call tomorrow. Well, I yeah, I talked to Timmy. I said, yeah, I think I should you know but I didn't want to be like rude and like assume that they weren't gonna pay it. Are you not going to call it Nope. I want to be through this. Well, yeah. When it's when we need to start And that's fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I can do that tomorrow. Um, Thank you. 
executive session to talk about First, well, no. we have bills. Oh, no. uh, well, I didn't turn the other side. I wonder what I'm doing. Hey. Okay. Place some bills. Any questions? Sorry to have dropped the ball. Yes. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. General. So the general fund, we have mm -hmm. abstracts totaling four hundred thirty-five thousand one hundred four dollars and twenty-five cents. Sorry, I can't. Okay. So we have a motion to. Awesome. Awesome. And we have a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Number kind of one-time large payment things that drop out that high. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hartford. Hartford, yeah. A lot of once a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any okay. discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Okay. EMS billing for thirty thousand three hundred thirty-four dollars and ninety-three cents. I move that we pay thirty thousand three hundred thirty-four dollars and ninety-three cents for EMS billing. Second. Okay. Any discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Over there. Yes. Aye. Aye. Thank you. No, there was a I moved that we can put the whole off time. Go ahead, no, go ahead. For the water fund, I moved that we pay $40,093.08. Okay, any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Store fund, $18,550.69. I moved that we pay $18,550.69 from the store fund. Second. Second. The sludge helmet. Yes, sir. Can't get rid of it until the press is in. And actually, the press went in. Or I, I think the press was in. I saw the I saw the cranes moving it in today. So I think it's in place. Okay. So that's your sludge. Cut down that cost. That's a pretty expensive press. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. So did, did we resolve the Camden group? Uh, yes. Stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You backed off. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Um, any other discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It passes. Capital one improvement well water project for sixty-seven thousand twenty-five dollars and seventy-one cents. I move that we pay sixty-seven thousand twenty-five dollars and seventy-one cents for the capital improvement water well project. Say aye. 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 Capital improvement wastewater treatment of seventeen thousand one hundred two dollars and no cents. I move that we pay the capital improvement for water waste treatment plant plant project seventeen thousand one hundred and two dollars. Second. Okay. Second. <coughs> Discussion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Abstained. And the last one is trusted agency for $48,167.48. Um, we pay the trusted agency abstract the amount of $48,167.48. Any discussion? No, I'm going to pay this guy. All right. All right. Oh, stay. I'm going to be paying dental separate uh, by a uh, person. I, I don't know. <laughs> Consortium doesn't offer dental. So we pay so for we each have, person separately? It's um, the voluntary add on. Okay. So we have a lot to do in some of So it comes. Are you talking about audit and voucher? Why would it just be a deduction from their paycheck? It is. Are you talking about the three there that are for me and Susan? And, yeah, yeah. Um, what happened in January was that uh, our dental split our program into three separate groups. We're now single. And it must be like two people, just two people, and then family. So Susan and uh, Tom and I are the only people that have two people. So we actually got a rebate. We got money back. Money back. That's what that's for. Okay. Yep. So, do we have minutes? 
Uh, no. Okay, so that's yeah. not there. So public comment. Any other comments from the public? Oh, there is a... Did I use my three minutes or anything to add another three? Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is like round three already. <laughs> well, let me just say it. Really they really get an every present please. Jack Cats, 13 South Street. Um, I appreciate uh, all the work you put in here. It's really uh, remarkable that as basically volunteers, you're you know doing your homework and getting things done. So well, thank you. Where is Nancy Tabs? She's in California. She's in California. Her daughter? With her daughter. With her daughter. No, she's with no, her daughter. She's no. the daughter. Nancy's the daughter. Oh, I thought she was the daughter. No, she, she moved with her way. No, she, she has a little California. She goes to and her, takes her mother there. Warner. For the winter. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love California now. Okay. Well, thanks for your little off topic right now. Yeah. So, I'm hoping we go and we have a session with this first time. And legal representation. Yes. Okay, and hold on. Only a second. Mary, go ahead. I second. Okay. All of you favor say aye. Aye.